It is good to be back in God's house again. I'm glad that you are here with us. Long road. I just want to say, I just want to really say thank you to all of the folks uh, that allowed us to be in this space down here. And by the way, I'm super excited about the new gym that we have, which will be underway in the next few weeks. Uh, we're not going to let that sit very long without rims hanging on those hoop, you know, on the, on the backboards up there. So we're going to work on that right away now as this is, uh, as this is really completed down here. But I just want to say before I begin sharing today, thank you, Tom. Um, I just want to say thank you to all of the folks. This, this, this work began here uh, for this side of the building uh, about 12 years ago. And uh, what's a neat thing is if any of you are from this area, there's an engineer named Bill Cooper who uh, has since gone home to be with the Lord, but he, he, he uh, worked two doors down from here, two buildings down. And Bill originally designed this, this building right here uh, when it was originally built, this section of the building right here. And, uh, and Bill was the one that redesigned the purpose with, with me. I got to sit with Bill and redesign it for this use that we have here right now. And I'm so thankful for that. But I'm thankful for all of the people that have sacrificed and served along the way. So many of you in the last, uh, in the last bunch of years have given, have prayed, have served, have, have worked here uh, so that we can have a comfortable, attractive place, comfortable and to meet. And how do you like the chairs? Aren't the chairs good? <laughs> Love the chairs. So, um, so you can be comfy on your little tissue while you're sitting there hanging out. It's great stuff. But thankful for all of the work that has gone into this. So much sacrifice and, and uh, countless, countless hours of effort and prayer and labor and, and, uh, and a lot of dollars. And the cool thing, I want you to hear this, is we did this in such a way that there is no debt. Uh, we didn't build debt, borrow a loan, and here we are. It's paid in full right now. So, so all of the money that we have now that we gain through tithes and offerings as you give and you continue to give, we're going to use to further the God's work, not to pay interest on the loan that we borrowed to get here. That, that doesn't exist. So this is bought and paid for, and we thank the Lord for that. And it's because of your faithfulness and your tithes and offerings uh, that we've been able to do that. So I wanted to kind of just say thank you uh, right from the very beginning. We will have a grand opening Sunday when we're not limited to 25% capacity and invite all of the folks that have been a part of this uh, many of them are not from this church. They're from other churches that have supported us here and have given and served faithfully uh, so that we could have what God has given us right now. I want to finish, uh, ironic, the last week of Christianity 101, we get to meet together. So if you've been catching this online, you've got all, I don't know, eight weeks or nine weeks or whatever it was of this series. And we're in the teachings of, uh, of Christ uh, recorded in the Gospel of Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. So we'll be in Matthew chapter 7 and we'll pick it up uh, in verse 24. But before we go there, let me go back to the beginning of this teaching that's called the Sermon on the Mount, which begins with the Beatitudes. And I want to read those again to you because Christ is beginning something new, the introduction of something new. And have you ever introduced something new uh, to your company, to your family, to your team, wherever you are? There's mixed reviews on something new, aren't there? Some people embrace it and some people are like, eh, I'm not up for that right now. Have you ever, we, um, we, did, uh, we did vacations in Myrtle Beach for a few years. We had a motor home, so we'd drive down there, we'd park in an RV park on the beach, and we'd do vacations with the family. It was kind of a, an inexpensive vacation. But when we, we sold our motor home, and we introduced something new to the kids as far as the vacation, and it was like, ah, we like Myrtle Beach, we don't want to go somewhere else, you know, and, and the introduction didn't go really well. So sometimes when you introduce something new, it doesn't always go well. It's not always received well right away. So Christ starts out in this amazing way, with all the wisdom of the Godhead bestowed on him, when he begins to speak and the Holy Spirit empowers him with the words of the Beatitudes. Really, his first public words to anyone that was there. The crowds were there, then he had the apostles and the disciples. But this is really where he began, right here, with the Beatitudes. And I want you to hear these words as he begins this, this teaching of what we call the Sermon on the Mount, which could have been a compilation of, of a few different times when Christ spoke over a day, a week, even, some say even a longer period of that, but we have them all brought together here in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. So allow me, if I can, uh, to allow Christ to introduce something new. Matthew chapter 5, we'll begin in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its taste, how shall it be made salty or the saltiness be restored to it? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This is something new. This is something new. Meeting again is something new for us today, isn't it? COVID was something new for us. New is part of life. Sometimes new is great and we're excited about it. Sometimes the new is not so embraced by us. Christ was preparing his apostles, the disciples, and the followers of himself. He was preparing them for something new. So he let them know where their heart should be. See, before this, the regulations of the law strictly applied to the outward expressions, attitudes, speech, garment, appearance, and performance. Now Christ is saying it's much more important than just what's on the outside. I think it's important, and Christ says this as part of the Godhead, he says, I think it's important on what's on the inside of you, where your heart attitudes are. And this is something new. He goes on to say that man won't be just judged by God for what he does, but how he thinks, what he meditates on, what he contemplates. The attitudes of the heart will be judged by God. This is something new. And also the performance is going to be very different from the Old Testament law that required a physical performance to, uh, to meet the requirements of the law. So in summary, the way we act and react is a declaration as to who is at the controls of our lives, who guides our hearts, our words, our actions, our spending, our saving, and our reactions when we're wronged. Christ goes on to speak, and we know it as Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, through chapter 7, verse 20. And this is the last bunch of weeks that we've, I've talked about Christianity 101. And he talks about all the stuff that we involve ourselves in. Things like murder and anger, adultery and lust, divorce and selfishness, oaths and integrity, revenge and forgiveness, charity, humility, the spiritual disciplines of prayer and fasting, generosity and greed, faith and worry, judging others, and personal holiness, persistence, and contentment. All the stuff that our lives are made out of, isn't it? If we want to be honest, that's all the stuff our lives are made out of. All those balances and all that, and all those, uh, those traps in sin that we get caught in, those things that, that kind of pull us aside in our life. Christianity 101, we have to deal with this stuff right from the very beginning. This is the foundational teaching that all of Christ's teaching for the rest of his three and a half years of ministry will hinge on right here. Matthew's chapter 5, 6, and 7. And today we get a chance to wrap it up with a parable, which I think is a really amazing thing that Christ did. It boggles my mind how he ties this all together in this teaching. He begins with the Beatitudes. In other words, praising people and considering them blessed for changing their heart attitudes. And then he wraps it up with a parable that every one of us can relate to after dealing with all of our own sin issues. I mean, there's not, there's not one thing between Matthew 5, 17 and 7, 20 that doesn't affect us in this room. All of us struggle with one avenue or another of those sin issues. So he ends with this, a parable stressing what has been taught and the possible outcomes if adhered to. He gives us, he gives us two plot twists. One, if we follow Christ's teaching, here's how it's going to turn out. Two, if we don't follow Christ's teaching, here's how it's going to turn out. And, you, and I get to make a decision on this. But he does it in a really cool way because he doesn't point the finger. He just says, let me tell you a story. I just want to tell you a story. So I'm going to read that story to you. It's pretty brief today. And it's at the end of Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 24. And he likens it under two, two guys that are builders. So here, uh, here this one. But it's really not about builders. It's about you and I and the construction of our lives and what the foundation of that construction is built upon. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who builds his house on a rock. So Christ is saying, okay, we got a builder. He's a wise builder. And if you do, if you hear what I said, and you do what you heard, you're like this guy. That's where we are. So if you heard the words of Christ, if you read Matthew chapter 5, 
6 and 7, and you look at all those topics that are in there, from the blessed bees, which are hard to be, right? It's hard, it's hard to mourn and say, you know what? I'm blessed to be able to mourn. I'm, I'm blessed to be able to be meek. I'm blessed to be able to be poor in spirit. The crowd says, no, you are. It's actually a good place to be. And then he deals with all of our, our, our sin issues, murder and anger and, and humility and spiritual disciplines of prayer and fasting. Who doesn't struggle with those kind of things? We all do. And if we look around the church today, of us all socially distanced Christians right here today, we look around and say, you know, we all struggle with some of these things. Nobody is exempt from that. If you look around, you probably got someone in here that struggles with lust or greed or drunkenness or self-centeredness, depression, anxiety. It's all here. We're all here. Anger. And Christ says, I know that you do. Don't pretend that you don't. Come, to bed, come together, be the body of Christ, and know that you do. But I want you to hear something. I want you to hear that how you can build your life can be great. And I want you to know why it can be great. He who builds his house on the rock. And then he goes on in verse 25, and he says, And the rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew, and it beat on that house, and it did not fall. I love this part. What he's saying is, if you accept the teachings of Christ, and you accept Christ in your heart, and you begin to follow those type of teachings, you call yourself a Protestant, if you would, and you found that your salvation is, was founded on a cross, not on our works, not on your works or my works, but on the cross. Christ did it all. That you know what, even in your life, the rains are going to come, and it's going to beat on your house. Some of you, as Christians, have had lives that, that God has allowed circumstances to just beat on it. You have, been through, you have been through hell and back. You have been through tough times. You have been through anxiety and depression and substance abuse and people abandoning you. You have been through financial ruin and your kids walking away from you. You have been through disease and everything you can name. And it's happened to you or someone in your family. You've lost some loved ones that you didn't want to and it beat against your house. And when you and I are founded on the principles of Jesus Christ, and we understand that it's blessed to be those things that he talked about, the Beatitudes. And we abandon sin every moment that we have, and we say, Christ, as much as I screw up today, I want to come back to you. I want to come back to the foot of cross and realize who you are and where I get my strength from. And he says, your house, it won't move. Some of you have been through horrible situations in the past few years in your life. You have. It's been, it's been a nightmare. It's been brutal. And you're like, wait a minute. If I'm a Christian, shouldn't God just kind of lay out the, the carpet for me? The, the red car Once I accepted Christ. Isn't the red carpet supposed to be rolled out and off do we go to see the wizard, you know, kind of thing? No, it doesn't work that way. Christ says that it's still going to come. When you build your house, when you build your life on the foundational teachings of Jesus Christ, it doesn't make this life easier. It gives you the ability to hold up when it's not easy. It gives you the structural integrity that when the winds come and the storms come and disease shows up and addiction grabs a hold of you and another person in your life betrays you and walks away, when you struggle with stuff inside your head that nobody can understand but you and it's wrecking your day, you can say, wait a minute, I'm okay. Hmm. This doesn't make sense, but I'm, I'm okay. You know why? Because you built your life on the foundational teachings of Jesus Christ. Not on, not, on, not on personal, I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps. Not I'm going to surround myself only with positive people. Because you can't. Christ didn't surround himself with positive people. Who did he surround himself with? Sinners, Samaritans, 12 guys that couldn't hold it together to save their lives. And you know what? He relied on the power of the Holy Spirit to sustain him as he ministered to other people. Hmm. That's pretty great, isn't it? He gives us this, this parable and he gives us the back end of this parable. He said, the house stood because it was founded on the rock. No other reason. Because it knew where to anchor to. Have you guys ever seen my favorite weather guy in the world, Jim Cantori? How many of you know who Jim Cantori is? He's this big, he's big, he's a big jack dude, right? And big, Jim Cantori is out there in these hurricanes and these storms and these tropical depressions, and he's leaning into it like this, and the dude is huge, right? And the, somehow the microphone's picking up, and he's standing there, and the trees are blowing over, and the waves are blowing, and, and Jim Cantori is just kind of standing there giving us the, the lowdown on the, the eye of the storm. And it's really great to see that when Christians go through that, that they can anchor like that. They can say, you know what? This is rough. This is ugly. This is difficult. This is not fun, but... I'm okay. And I'm not okay because I'm okay. I'm beca okay because of who I'm attached to, and he's okay. That makes all the difference in the world. 
This gets rid of that self-help kind of concept that we have in our world floating around. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Okay, but who gave you the boots? And who strapped them? Those are all gods. See, when we understand that our anchor is in, in the person and the work of Jesus Christ, it takes all ego and pride out of our lives. And we realize that anything I can do, like Paul says in Philippians, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Without Christ giving me strength, I'm done. What a great thing to see what happened in our culture, culture right now. In the middle of a global pandemic, in the middle of a global pandemic, that's something that we've never seen before. We've never, we've never, I've never seen this. In the middle of a global pandemic, Satan just drops right in the middle of it. He pulls the pin and he drops it right in the middle of humanity and splashes it all over media, a racial divide. The murder of an innocent man by an officer of the law. Right in the middle of it, just to make it worse. Pull the pin, boom! If I can't divide the church by not letting them meet, this will divide churches that have color in them. Boom, there it goes. This will make communities erupt. This will cause rioting and tensions and loss and, and, and there'll be more imprisonments. People will lose their lives. Satan's like, yes! All it took was one little life to do all this. One, one little thing, and it sparked the whole globe again in the middle of a, of a tense situation with a pandemic. I had the privilege of going to a Black Lives Matter rally. Loved every minute of it. Never been to a rally before or a protest in my life. Never once, ever. And I loved every minute of it. I enjoyed the fact that humanity is what matters, really. It was a beautiful thing to see it. People of all different colors were standing there hugging in fact, there was a moment that I, that I, that's in my mind's eye till the day that I die is I saw some people of color hugging an officer of the law in uniform. That's what it's about. That was what it was about. And Satan tried to attack the culture. He tried to attack the church. He tried to attack people with fear. And what happened? You're sitting here today, aren't you, on the first day open? God bless you. God bless you for being assembling in a house of God that you could assemble in today. And for all the other churches that are trying to do the exact same thing, while maintaining social distance and government guidelines. Let me read to you the end of this story, verse 28. It says, Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice, or does not do them, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Same house. Not a different house. Different foundation. Different anchor point. And the rains fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and they beat against his house. Same storm. Different result. It fell, and great was the fall of it. You may have been there at one point in your life where, where life beat against your house. And for you, it ended up in, in divorce, or a separation, or financial ruin, or a relapse into addiction. Welcome to the club. Many of us have. Many of us have. We go back to our vice. We go back to the, 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 the sin issues that we have between Matthew 5, 17 and 7, 20. We go back to that, to what we know, instead of being anchored and saying, you know what, this isn't going to rock my world. This temptation this, this is not going to rock my world. Christ is the one who sustains me. He keeps me. He loves me. I'm not moving. You don't have to listen to that voice that says, no, this is what you know. This is what you go back to every time difficulty happens. This is your go-to mechanism. When people abandon you and, you and you feel left out, when addiction calls your name, when, when pressure comes into your life, how do you react? Well, the house on the rock doesn't move. It just stands there like, whatever. I'm good. No, I'm really good. You ever had something crazy like that happen to you, and you're just like, wow, I'm okay. I remember a bunch of years ago, uh, actually it was, it was the year we started this church, because Satan even threw the kitchen sink at me. He tried to hit me in the head with it. I ducked, but he hit me with it. Um, my mother-in-law died that year. Our business had some major issues, my company, and, um, and I broke my neck and ended up having spinal fusion surgery. All in like a time, and when we started the church. So there I am, I, I recovered from surgery. The surgery was a nightmare. It didn't go well, the anesthesia. I flatlined on the table. Thank God it was at Albany Med. I woke up eight hours later. It was a three hour surgery. And I woke up and my wife's standing there with tears in her face and I'm like, we're good, right? We okay? Am I right? Am I still alive? You know, kind of looking at her. I couldn't talk. And she's like, yeah, I'm good. I remember that night she went to the hotel across the street from Albany Med there and stayed there. You know, many of you have experienced that. Many of you have. 
And I remember waking up during the night and pushing the button for pain because, you know, they cut a hole in your throat and they put some hardware in your neck and all that. And I remember having a peace that passes all understanding. I didn't know what I was going to do to feed my family. I wasn't going to be able to work for three months. I didn't have anybody to cover for me. We just started the church. I don't know if I'm going to be able to speak next week. I had no idea what this was going to look like. I was hoping my left arm would come back. I lost the use of my arm. And I'm like, Lord, this is a lot. And then I woke up during the middle of the night. Because my wife and I had been praying about this for weeks and months and years, that God would sustain us through anything he brought our way. Not because of our own strength, of our own independence, or our own courage, or grabbing a hold of our own bootstraps, but because, because we were anchored to a, a long-standing faith in Jesus Christ for many, many years, that we had had the privilege of walking with the Lord. I woke up during the middle of the night, pushed the pain button, and smiled. Now, maybe it was because of the medication, but I think more of it was there was a crazy peace inside of me. that I said, God's got this. I have a million questions. I don't know how it's going to work out. I have no idea. But it's going to be okay. And it wasn't because I began to walk with God when things got rough. It's because we had had the privilege of walking God for a long season ahead of time. So when things got rough and the winds blew and the storms came to Christians that were trying to do the right thing and they still come and it beat the stuffing out of our house, we were there saying, okay, Lord, we still love you and we need you more than ever. And as the months rolled along after that, I recovered. We recovered financially. The church was fine. We did okay. Not because of anything that we did, but because of a dependence on Jesus Christ, the person and the work of Jesus Christ. I would want that in the middle of that for every single one of you. I wouldn't want any of you to go through what you're going to go through next in life. We don't know what the next chapter holds, do we? We have no idea. But I would love for you to go through it with that anchor that says, no matter what, I'm okay. I'm fine because Christ's got me. Not because of my independence or my confidence in my ability, but because Christ has got this and my faith in him. So let me summarize this if I can to give you some fun facts to go home with. Two groups of people. Those who hear the teachings of Christ and follow them. I would love for that to be you and I. I would love for you to hear the teachings of Christ and change your life into the teachings, what represent the teachings of Christ. Not try to bend the teachings of Christ into what you're doing. But to take your life and say, you know what? This doesn't align with Christ's teaching. I'm going to change. There's two groups of people. Those who hear the teachings of Christ and follow them, and those who hear the teachings of Christ and do not follow them. It's that cut and dry. It's that simple. And you know in your heart of hearts, because you have the Holy Spirit like I have the Holy Spirit, you know in your heart of hearts, when you hear a teaching of Christ, if you read through Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, you hear all those different topics that we all struggle with, all our sin issues, you can be like, ow, that hurt a little bit. I think I'm struggling there. I think I need to make some changes there. And hey, that area, I'm doing well in them. I'm having some success in there. That would be a great thing for you to do, to be able to hear the teachings of Christ and to follow them. Number two, bullet point number two, if I may, building anything will take sustained effort. No matter what you try to build in life that's worthwhile, it will take sustained effort. A sustained push for a long period of time. You don't raise a kid in five years. It takes 20 or 30 years to raise a child well and to develop and send them on their own. You don't start a business and have an overnight success that will just coast on into eternity making money. It doesn't happen that way. Physical health is not an overnight success. It's diligence every single day, sustained effort in our lives. Some of us struggle with that. Some of us struggle with consistency. It's a hard thing for some. Just doing the same thing every day because it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. It'll earn a great result in the end. Some of you struggle with that. We all struggle with that to some, some degree. Bullet point number three, if you would. Adversity comes to all. Did you know that the same storm hit the person who had, who had, a, who had a, a biblical teaching and foundation of Christ? It's hit the one that didn't. Same storm. It, it didn't discriminate. You think, well, wouldn't, wouldn't, if God loves his children, wouldn't he give them a bye? You know, wouldn't he make it easier for them? Nope. Do you know why? And that bothered me for a lot of years. Sometimes it still does. But why wouldn't God give Christians a buy on some trials or tribulations or diseases or addictions or, or just struggles? Why wouldn't he do that? If he loves us so much, I love my kids, I want to give them a buy on some things. Because God wants us to be dependent on him. God does, wants us to run back to him when it hurts real bad. Some of the most precious times that I had when my kids were really little, some of the most precious times I had is when they'd scrape their little knee or they'd fall down and they'd hit gravel with the palms of their hands. You know that, right? You all have been there. And when they come and they just want to wrap around me like a koala bear. And it's not bad. It's not a, it's not a big injury. But they just want their dad or their mom, right? 
And, and, and when we get hurt, when we're lonely, when we hurt, and when we're uncertain, where do we go? We go to daddy or mommy. And that's what God wants for us. When, when, when a Christian comes along a difficult situation and the winds are blowing in the storm, and it's just rough, whether it's rough from within or from without, God says, hey, why don't you come back up to me? Come here, I'll hold you. That's a precious, precious moment right then with God. I believe that's why God wants us to be able to experience some storms in life and difficulties so that we understand the intimacy that we can have with the Father that created us and that loves us. Adversity comes to all. Results. Well, the results are, 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 are very different. Uh, the house of the person, the builder, that didn't trust in Christ and didn't place his, his foundation where he built on the rock, it said it leveled it. It is completely gone. It is a total loss. But I want you to see what happens to those of us who say, you know what? I can't avoid hardship in life. I'm not going to run from it. God bring what may. That's cool. But I want to know what's going to happen to me in the end if I totally depend on you. If I'm flat out, I'm sold out, I'm being a Christian. What can I expect are the reactions out of my life for a person that does that? The results are this. Sustainability in your life. Sustainability. One thing that we all want is sustainability. We want to be able to continue to do tomorrow what we did today. Sustainability. It's big for me. Number two, consistency. This is the from within part. You can be consistent. How many of us are inconsistent? You love it now, you hate it then. The relationship's hot, the relationship's cold. I want to go to work, I hate my job. Wow, I gained weight, I lost weight. Me, I'm in the lost weight, I haven't found it again. So if you find my weight, let me know sometime, okay? Just pick it up and bring it back to me. Jess, don't laugh, that's not funny to you either. Consistency is important in our lives, isn't it? Consistency. Consistent amount of sleep, a consistent amount of work, consistent amount of Bible reading. We struggle with that. But following the teachings of Christ gives us the ability to be sustainable and consistent. Focus. How many of you lose focus? I was running around this church this week with so many different people. And I was going from this room to that room to this room to that room to this room, trying to remember to wear my mask around some people, and blah, 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 blah. I'd get into a room, and you did this too, don't laugh at me too long. I get into a room like, why am I here? What am I doing in this room? What did I come here for right now? Yeah, we've done that, right? It's bad when you wake up in the morning going to the bathroom and you figure out, what am I here for? Well, let me just tell you, just open the lid, you'll figure it out, okay? That's what you're in the bathroom for. But hey, I run around. Focus is an important thing for those who, who follow the teachings of Christ. You'll be able to have a sustained focus over a long period of time in your life. You won't change jobs a lot. You won't, be, you won't change friendships a lot. You'll have more focus in, in certain areas of your life, and you'll have success in those focus. We'll get to that in a minute. What's next? Durability. When the storm comes, you'll be able to take more than you've ever taken before. You'll be able to say, five years ago, I wouldn't have made it through this. But now, I'm good. Thank you, Lord. It's not a credit to you or I and our toughness. It's just saying I'm more durable because I'm more founded in the teachings of Christ and I've applied them to my life. Don't you want this in your life? Don't you want to be more durable when things come your way? Don't you want to be able to say, you know what? Nothing's going to rock my world. I'm founded in Jesus Christ. This is the path I'm taking in life with my family, with my job, with my church, with my health and fitness, and this is the direction I'm going to go. So no matter what comes, I'm going to keep going. I'm good. That's a great way to be able to be because many of us don't have that quality in our life to the extent that we'd like it. Uh, number five, steadfastness. The ability to stay the course no matter what comes our way. Not just endure it, but to be able to say, I have the same energy, the same focus, the same excitement about what I'm doing. That's a great quality to have in every leader. I think it's a great quality to have in every Christ Christian. Number six, the ability to finish well. How many of you started something that you weren't able to finish? It's that project somewhere, and you didn't finish it, or, or something in your life that you, you didn't finish well in your life. But, but following the teachings of Christ gives the ability to say, you know what? I began this. God began a good work in me. Let's see it through to completion. When you found your, your life on the teachings of Jesus Christ, what you begin, you will be able to finish well. And last but not least is the results will be success. When you found your life on the teachings of Christ, you will have success in all that you set out to do when guided by Christ to do just that. Not in all that you have to do, but when you're guided by Christ to do what you're called to do, you will finish it. The room you're sitting in today is a great testimony of what Christ did. No man, just God. Lots of effort, lots of hours, thousands of human hours spent to build this room. But God began a work, and God himself finished the work, using his children that were obedient and called and durable. And I'm thankful for all of those. I'm thankful for you being here today.
I don't know if this COVID thing is almost over, if it's going to relapse, if we're going to see a spike. I have no idea. I have no idea where you are with your job or your career path, where you are and you're, you're, uh, you're, you're sick and tired of wearing a mask or being social distance, or if you're like, I'm still scared about this whole thing, wherever you are. But I want God to do a good work in your life and in mine as it looks like we're coming to the close of this. It looks like we're on the upswing of this right now. We're assembling for the first time as a church with the guidance of the law that we've, we've, uh, we've really submitted to the authority that allowed us to do what we're doing today. I'm very thankful for the laws that guide us and govern us. And I pray for you today that you can look back, and I pray that you do this. I pray that you go back through Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. It takes about a half an hour to read all three chapters. And say, you know what? I want to adhere to all these teachings. And you'll notice when you go back to those chapters as they topically address different areas of our life, you should be able to say, am I adhering to these areas or am I not? Is there room for growth in this area or not? And when you do, you may want to make some life changes so that you can have the results that we just talked about right now. I would want them for you. I would want those results for you in your marriage, in your family, in your health, in your business, in your goals and dreams for life. I would love for those. But our lives have to be founded on the foundational teachings of Christ in order to be all of those things of sustainable and durable and resilient. And I would pray that for you today. There may be some areas of your life that aren't that way, and they need some addressing, they need some changing. I would pray that the conviction of the Holy Spirit would fall on you in a very personal way, and that you would, with the power of the Holy Spirit, be able to make some changes in those areas so that you can have an amazing life, so that when life slams against you and those storms do come, you can be like, eh, that wasn't so bad. That was all right. I'm okay. I know who I'm anchored to. Let's have a word of prayer. God, thank you for the day, for all that you've done for us. Thank you for this time that we could be here right now. Lord, I am so excited. I was excited when I woke up early this morning to be able to know that I would be in a house full of believers today in your house. Thank you for the, the thousands and thousands of hours that were spent to prepare this room so it would be comfortable and attractive for people to come and know your word and study your word. Thank you for the teams of people that are working every week in and around Crossroads Community Church, Lord, that have loved you and served you all the way along. Thank you for those who have come back to church for the first time today. Uh, Lord, I pray that today was, was encouraging and instructive and challenging. Be with us, Lord. We're not quite out of this thing yet. Lord, there's a racial divide in our country. I pray that you would heal that, that you would help churches, the body of Christ, to help heal that. I pray that you'd be with the people that are fearful still, and there is much of that right now. I pray that you'd bless them, Lord, watch over them. People that, that were even a little fearful to assemble today, and that's okay, Lord. I pray that you'd, you'd guide them as they are home today, as they're listening to your word and studying. Give them a great time with family and friends. Thank you so much for those who dared to come out today. Uh, Lord, I am incredibly blessed by the, by the faith family that you have assembled. Be with us, and I pray that as we look at our lives, that we wouldn't want to to wrap Scripture around our existing life, but that we would wrap our life around Scripture, about, uh, about the foundational teachings of Jesus Christ, and that we would adhere closely to them and have an amazing, amazing journey on this earth as we do that. Bless us, Lord, as we serve you today and we sing to you today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.